Okay, so um, I got an email this morning that jumped to the top of my priority list. There's a funny old commercial. Um, I couldn't find it. I did try to look, but uh, my kids saw it on you know, YouTube commercials a couple of years ago. It's really funny. It was, it was for Planters Peanuts. And that peanut guy is, is Mr. Peanuts, like flying through the air in his little peanut car thing. And they're, they're playing this really fast paced uh, classic rock song. And uh, he like, he spins out in front of somebody's house and, you know, gets him the peanuts just in time before he has to eat some kale chips or something. I don't know. And uh, the tagline was peanut emergency. And my kids just thought that was the funniest thing. Um, so anyway, sometimes while I'm rolling through life, a thought will occur. Someone will send me an email. Uh, I'll get a, um, I don't want to say flashback, but something will come to mind from day before or some the week before or whatever. And um, the, the topic is, um, is such that I have a clear idea that someone's at a stopping point. They're stuck and they won't keep going until they, they won't be able to keep going until they find what they're, what they're missing to catalyze that. And so that's, that's a peanut emergency and it, it jumps to the top of my priority list. And it is like that, that peanut mobile flying through the air and, uh, you know, doing a, um, I can't remember what those what those slides are called now. Anyway, um, so I got an email this morning, and it was one of those cases. So um, here's here's a slightly edited version of this. I always try to uh, protect details and and help people uh, maintain anonymity. Okay, so this person asked, when hundreds of thoughts are going through your brain with questions, answers, and even more questions at a rate that almost seems impossible to catch up to, how do you react? I've been trying to write for hours and I can't find the right way to put almost anything because more and more thoughts, questions, and answers keep coming in. I don't know how to put any of these things into words concisely. How do you retain the value of things that you don't know how to record into words? What a good question. Okay, so let's peel this apart and see where things go. So I'm going to reread this and we're just gonna use this as a, as a prompt and see where we go. So when hundreds of thoughts are going through your brain with questions and answers and even more questions. So let's start there. Um, the Lord said, to him that has will more be given, and from him who doesn't have will be taken away. So one property of things that are from God is that they multiply. They get better, and they multiply. And so um, as you give more time or direction to the Lord, you orient yourself to his purpose to a greater degree um, in, in whatever way that might be, what's going to happen is you will see the fulfillment of his promise in Malachi to open the windows of heaven. Now, um, it's important to distinguish here or, or to, well, to draw attention to the fact that that opening of the windows of heaven will be perceived differently by different people. Now, I don't mean here that it will come in different forms. That is absolutely true, but that's not what I'm, what I'm pointing at. What I want to draw attention to is the fact that um, what will be exactly what is desired for some people will be the furthest thing from it for others, and there are people for whom everything in between is true. And so um, what, what you'll see is for example, here's just, just a very specific example. Sometimes people will pray and pray and pray for a spiritual experience, and then a second, God opens that up to them. They beg for him to take it away. 
Now that sounds very odd. Those people would never describe it that way, but that's what you're doing. When you say, Lord, it's enough. Lord, it's enough. So when God turns on the tap, you need to hold on for dear life and just just hold on and beg him to not go and just keep pouring it out. Same thing goes for angels. Um, there are instances in the scriptures where you see this pattern of someone who's wise enough to keep angels on the line, so to speak, or the Lord. Um, this is a funny story. My dad, he's an odd fellow. Uh, bless his heart, but he is an odd fellow. And my little sister and I, we have this game that he doesn't know about. He, he hates talking on the phone. It's, 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 he hates it. And I live far away from him. So that's that and texting are, those are my two options to keep in touch. And, um, when I can get him on the phone, the, the game is my sister and I, we, we see how long we can keep him on the phone. Because it's not, I mean, it's two minutes and he's like, well, I got to go. Or, well, uh, somebody's waiting for me or I got this thing to do. And it's always just some nonsense excuse. And, uh, you know, it's a fun game. But with, with channels to heaven, whatever they might be. Now, let's twist this around a little bit because we need to open your eyes a little bit more to this. The the channels from heaven, the, the, the windows to heaven, they are not always things you're going to see as good. And it's still so important to keep those as open as you possibly can. Um, there's this scene in one of the Thor movies where he has to open this aperture to let in radiation from this star to kickstart this furnace because he needs to rebuild his, his weapon and uh, he's, he's holding this thing open and getting blasted by the radiation while he's doing it. And it's interesting, I'm not going to go into it, but this is actually a trope from movies. You'll see this in multiple movies. And it's so um, informative. There's so much to it that, that I, I expect is fully beyond the people who wrote the movie and directed it. But um, so often those windows of heaven are like that aperture and it takes what seems like superhuman strength even to open it. But then the hardest thing is to stand in the fire as it's flowing. And um, a window to heaven could be a trial. So if you get bone cancer, that could be a window to heaven. You might think that's the weirdest thing in the world to hear. We don't have time now, but I could lead you through the scriptures over weeks a full-time effort. We could sit there for weeks and I could show you again and again and again how many times this is laid out. That one of the principal purposes for us being here is to learn through what we suffer. And our reaction to that suffering is what determines if this is a series of rungs towards heaven or um, something worse. So, if it takes us towards God or away from God, because it's going to be one. It's always one. Everything is. The stream of life brings you closer, takes you further away. And that's the wrong way to phrase it, because the agent isn't life, it's you. Your reaction determines what you get out of life. So, um, yeah, those windows of heaven, they, they can be very different than what you expect. In fact, that if you search that phrase in the scriptures... Um, I, I don't know if you can hear that, but the, the husky alarm clock is sounding. They, they get up, my dogs get up at the same time every day and start howling. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll try not to be too distracted by that. Um, geez, what was I saying? So, oh yeah, the windows of heaven. If you look up that phrase, you'll find it used to describe the blessings and also um, punishments. Punishments are described using that phrase. So it's very interesting. It's really, it's the judgments of God. Judgment doesn't always mean punishment. It's only punishment if you're evil. But if you're righteous, um, judgment sets you into, judgment always sets you into what you deserve. It's the outpouring of God's justice. So that can be positive or negative. Anyway, I say all that because I know people need it, but let's get back to what the person writing this needs 
So, and everyone in their same case. Um, which, by the way, I realize that very few people are in this case, but there are more than there's more than one person who is. And uh, for everyone else, it's valuable to see what's possible and have someone other than me saying that this sort of flood of information is possible. So um, God is very serious when he says, I will open the windows of heaven. Um, this he wants to teach you so much. He wants to teach teach you so badly and he also has so much to teach you and uh, that's we're here for that and so if you're not standing in this flood of information all the time there are things that you ought to change in your life to get there for sure okay so so you do get to this problem though where this flood is coming and you just don't even know where to put it and isn't that what he promised he said that the limiting factor, so there's a precondition to opening the windows of heaven. And um, TLDR, it is to do all you know. If you live up to your present sincere idea of Christ, he will open the heavens, which means he's going to flow more to you than you currently have of all things. So what's the stopping criteria? He gives it right there in Malachi room to receive room to receive he he goes up to what you're willing to receive so what that means well it includes several things but it's basically what you're willing to perceive receive value and become that's the that's the span of willing to receive it's that's those are the qualities of that state and so one form of limit is reaching the point where you can't adequately process what's there. So deriving all the good that's present in something, that's what we ought to be doing. That's what we ought to be aiming for. And as soon as we do, he'll send more. But until we do, the best thing he can do is leave us in that or if we really don't get it, to downgrade us to something worse. So, um, and just, just to underscore it one more time, I'm not preaching the, uh, what, what the world calls the prosperity gospel, worldly prosperity. Uh, the gospel is all about God's prosperity. It's very different. The distinction is that one is based on what God sees as good and the other is based on what you see as good. And those two things are not the same. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. So he says in Isaiah. So let's continue. So um, when you honor God, he delights to honor you. When you live up to what he gives you, he gives you more. So what do you do with it? How do you expand your ability to process these things? Um, on my, I have five acres, uh, but I have a homestead here. We, we have um, raised beds, we've got an orchard, we have uh, chickens, there's many, there are many things we've tried. We've had rabbits, we had a goat, we had pigs, we will probably get more animals here at some point, but Everything's a constant experiment in terms of trying to produce things on our land and get our land into the, the state where it can produce things. And um, when you're successful, what happens is you have more work to do, right? Because you have more things to process. So, for example, um, when we have a big apple crop, this year is pretty bad harvest because it's just a, a function of the weather. But and timing of it, but um, we still ended up with quite a few apples and the time it takes to process those, it takes away from everything else. So you set up these processes to generate produce and then you have to process the produce. So you need processes for processing the results of your process. <laughs> so this is completely overlapped with what we're talking about here. Um, so in the beginning, when we just had a few trees, we had a hand crank apple masher 
and I bought a press to press out juice so we can make apple cider. And um, that hand crank, it took a lot of work and a lot of time, I think. So, so five gallons of apples yields one gallon of juice, give or take. And it took, I don't know, 20 minutes of hard cranking to mash up five gallons of apples. So I spent, I can't remember how long it took me, uh, probably like 140 hours total, some obscene amount of time, researching and building my own apple crusher. I looked into buying one and they're, they're a ridiculous amount of money. And I, I thought, well, I'm just gonna have to build one. It won't be as nice, but it'll be a lot less expensive. And so I did. Um, and to give you an idea of how involved this was, um, so the, the, it, the, the base of it is a sawhorse that I built, and then the motor on it, it's got an electric motor that I pulled off of a, um, an old air compressor whose piston had locked up. It was, it was seized up, but the, the motor was good. So I took the motor off of that and made kind of like a little janky base. And then I had to find the right size pulley wheel for it which was way more difficult than it should have been and I, I had some false positives I bought some that didn't fit and then I had to weld it on and I'm not a good welder yet um, so that took a bunch of time and and some later some retries later because it came off um, but but the main thing that took a lot of time was I had to design a flywheel and build it and find the right size belt and find out how to do the math on the 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 ratio conversion from the the uh, pulley wheel on the motor and the rpms of the motor versus how fast i wanted the drum to spin and then i had to make a drum and i really wanted to buy one but i could not find anything that would work so i had to find a piece of wood in my wood pile that didn't have cracks in it which took a ridiculous amount of time for what it was and then I bought um, stainless steel screws, and then I thought up a way, I made this, this frame on my table saw, and um, <laughs> I, I, I found a way to somehow drill a hole through this, this piece of wood, because I didn't have a drill bit that was big enough. And I hammered, I used as a shaft, I used a, uh, a piece of half inch galvanized pipe I got that hammered through and then I, I, I fashioned this lathe using my, my table saw, this wooden frame that sat on it and a piece of rebar that I mounted onto the frame that the shaft was on. And basically I just I wheeled up my table saw a little bit and I spun this thing back and forth getting, you know, sprayed with all the wood shavings and uh, just kept doing that until it was a perfect cylinder and uh, so I shaved down all the nubs and everything got rid of all the bark and then it was a good cylinder and then I just put all the stainless steel screws into it and that's my drum so now it's it's uh, it's this big hopper that sits on this homemade um, sawhorse with this motor or flywheel and a drum and we can crank out five gallons of apple mash in like 30 seconds. So investments yielded a faster process. And the name of the game with everything we do on the homestead is impact. So we're trying to get the greatest yield out of the least amount of time, subject to environmental changes so that it works well now, it'll work well as things get more expensive and it'll provide something when there's no power, if and when there's no power, or things are just um, so expensive that they're out of reach or intermittent or whatever. So those are the constraints we're operating under. Okay, so can you see the parallels? That was all a lot of detail, but I guess the point here is that normal people don't do any of the things I just described. They couldn't be bothered, right? And... Um, What's the difference? Well, um, normal people just go and they buy apples from the store. And that's all well and good under current conditions. 
Now, under current conditions, there is still a difference. One difference is my way costs a lot more time and money under current conditions. But my way also yields, depending on the nutrient, something like 30 times more vitamins and minerals than their way. So there's an enormous nutritional difference between a store apple, which has been grown on land that's been growing apples for 100 years or more, and uh, typically, and an apple that you grew at home. There, there are varieties that you can't buy at the store, although, frankly, Honeycrisp is a really, really good apple. You'd be hard-pressed to, to find one that grows um, like an unknown variety that's better than that. Anyway, um, how are things going to change as, as conditions change? Well, as conditions change, um, the value available will be radically different. People won't be able to buy store apples, um, but I'll still have tons here. So um, there's that. Anyway, let's tie this directly to this idea of revelation. So um, normal people don't ask God questions, but uh, those who begin to do so and do so in an efficacious way, which is not the topic of this video, how to actually get it, get revelation. But those who are living by what they know and then they're asking in the right way, um, they will get revelation. And you very quickly, you'll, you'll have these challenges on your hands of how to process that more rapidly. We've learned other tricks too, like uh, in, in terms of, it's not just grinding the apples, but we've learned tricks to can juice faster. We have tricks for doing dehydrated apples a lot faster. Um, we make applesauce and apple butter. And we've, we've generated all these ways of doing it um, faster, but still getting a high quality product on the other side. And along the way, there are things you have to buy. Some of them are very expensive. There are things you have to learn. Some of them you can't just Google. That's a surprise when you start doing homesteading stuff, especially under less than favorable conditions. You find that there aren't people out there. You know, you can Google how to change a tire on your car or, you know, how to fix crown molding or something in your house, but unclog your drain. But when it comes to, um, or even how to integrate um, an equation, but... Um, when it comes to things like this, there's just no information out there. And that's, that's kind of a surprise, which is that these are all valid analogous points. And you can mine them as deeply as you'd like. Um, but the point is that it takes investment. You need to spend money, um, not, not literally in this sense, but you need to invest time and effort into finding ways to make it more efficient. Um, and sometimes there will be people out there who can guide you, and sometimes there won't be. And so you need to find what's available and then find what's not. So um, another thing that, that I have the duty to mention is that every answered question will come with more questions. And so all the more reason to learn how to do this efficiently, right? And uh, it's also important to note here that like so many other things in the gospel, the topic of how to efficiently process revelation and revelation itself, it's just a subset of principles that apply in many other areas. So one thing that God has shown me is very important to help you see that, that something that I need to do is help people be more productive in all things in life. This is something he's taught me a lot about. And it turns out the reason for this, uh, I'll get to this with Revelation. And so as I speak about this in terms of Revelation, you should also think about this in terms of all temporal activities like what you would spend any amount of time on. 
because it's the same. So years ago, uh, I, was, I was begging, I was praying fervently over time for the Lord to increase the rate of revelation that he was giving me because I am always so hungry and thirsty for more light and truth. And he replied, and I, I tried to look up because I write down revelations and I couldn't find this one. So it's, it's somewhere, but I don't know where. But the gist of what he said was, he said, look at your schedule right now. And at that time, I think I was spending maybe, let's say, an hour or two per morning in the scriptures. And then because of the way my work at the time was kind of, uh, you know, in the army, we'd call it hurry up and wait. But it was um, intermittent where I'd, I'd, I, ha I had... <clears throat> I had to be all in for some period of time. And then I'd have these waiting periods where there was nothing I could to, do to advance the purpose of my work. And this is temporal work, getting a paycheck kind of work. And so in those, in those blocks of time, and I'd have five minutes or one minute or 15 minutes or 45, then I would use those whenever they occurred uh, throughout the week. I'd use those as extra time to do scripture type stuff. Um, which I, I haven't come up with a good label for this. Maybe it's best to just um, call it time communing with God. But if anyone has a nice short label for that, I'd, I'm interested to hear it. Because uh, it's not exactly writing. And it's not exactly praying uh, specifically. It's not specifically praying or writing. Anyway, or reading scripture. Um, but it contains all those things or worship or prayer I think I might have said that already anyway so that's where I was at that point in my life and so he flashed that before my eyes he said where exactly do you have more time to write down anything extra that I would give you because there's already so much falling through the cracks for precisely the reasons that uh, this person mentions and there wasn't room to receive and I was like Oh, you got me. You got me. And uh, that's that's a frequent theme when when at least when I pray to God, he's like, well, let me explain this to you. And then I say, oh, OK, I get it. And so that was a roundabout invitation for me to find ways to be more efficient in at least two ways. One. In my work. So I mentioned at the time I had these these. Uh, uh, peaks and valleys of intensity at work and there were wait times during which there was nothing I could do to advance the purpose of my work and in those moments those periods I would obviously the highest priority for me um, would would become this this time I could take with the Lord so um, I guess I was also commuting two hours a day so I had an hour in the morning, two hours of commute, and um, then periods during the day, and it just wasn't enough time. So, uh, or I should say the Lord filled that with surplus. He overflowed it, pressed down and, and flowing over, just as he said. Um, so um, I thought about how I could get more out of less time with the duties that were incumbent upon me at home and at work. And um, I found ways of doing that. And then I thought on the spiritual side, how can I be more efficient? And I discovered many ways of doing that. And um, that's kind of where you need to go. So a lot of times when we talk about what's available from the Lord, the question that should arise is, where's the space for that? Because with how your life is structured right now, it's exceedingly likely that you don't have enough space for the things that he would like to put in your life. Um, there are two ways to make space. One is voluntarily uh, with your own proactivity. And the other way is for him to take it away. And uh, the first way is better. The first way is definitely better. 
for a multitude of reasons. Um, so f first and foremost, it's a, it's a demonstration of faith and everything God does is through faith, but your joy is much greater when you proactively choose a change than when it is thrust upon you involuntarily. The blessing is much greater. And the joy you receive from it is also much greater. That's part of the blessing, but that's not the whole shebang. So, um, how can you become more efficient at um, reducing, we, we could say just capturing revelation. How do you become more efficient at capturing revelation? Now, in things I've written in the past and published, I think I used this analogy of survival uh, tactics when you're when you're in a survival situation um, the thing that will kill you most quickly is cold um, but well I mean other than violent actions of other people but I'm saying as far as your your bodily maintenance goes cold will kill you first um, lack of water is the second threat and so you've got about three days, if you're a normal person, uh, until you die from lack of water. And so you need to find water immediately. So it's, it's shelter from cold and then water. Those are your priorities. Um, so there are various things you can do. You can dig a giant hole and put a big sheet of plastic over it and way down the middle and water will condense and run down and it could drip into a container but you need plastic, you need a container, you need the, the safety and tools required to dig a giant hole um, and so on. So that's not always practical. You can cut into certain plants and depending on the plant, the tactic's a little different, but some plants are sources of water. So it's great if you can find those plants and you have a means of slicing into them, then you can get water that way. Um, but you have to recognize them and they have to be available. There's some profound wisdom there. Um, digging the hole as well. That's, there's some symbolism in that. Um, but another thing you can do is just wait on the rain. And you don't really know when it's going to rain, so you just have to make as many vessels as you can. So you can use leaves if you have giant leaves or if you can find any kind of man-made objects, uh, just anything that's waterproof that, that can collect water, you lay them out everywhere. And if you've got it, you lay it out. So then when it rains, those things are filled up and now you've got water, right? So um, you have to become more efficient at gathering water. And um, it's the same thing with Revelation. You can lay out things so that you can capture it better than you do. Like you can have notepads all over the place, um, which I do. And uh, you can type things into your phone. I email myself things all day, every day, as thoughts come to mind, if I don't have something to write with and write on. Um, some people do voice notes. Um, so what are more efficient ways you could process those things? So um, when you collect something, the most efficient thing you can do is collect it in such a way that the processing is easier, right? So one reason I email myself things is because then it's already typed up. Now I can't type nearly as fast on my phone as I can on my computer. So if I'm around my computer, that's what my go-to is just to type it directly. And um, as I'll get into in a minute, I try to put it as close to its final destination as I know how to do so. Um, so if I type it, all I have to do is copy paste it to where it's gonna go. If I write it, I then have to type it up. Now I know a gal who gets tons of revelation, just insane amounts, and she swears by writing it with a pen in a book. I am a, I don't want to say I'm an opponent of this, but I'm an opponent of this. And the reason is you can't search a book without reading it. 
takes an immense amount of time. You can't transfer what's in a book without typing it or saying it or writing it again. And that also takes an immense amount of time. I journal on a computer. I write everything I write as far as notes on a computer. And the reason is I can search it. Now, it may be that the real reason this particular person won't type things is she is deathly afraid of people finding what she writes. And there are things you can do. You can encrypt your files pretty easily. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we can't be ashamed of Christ. We have to, I mean, we're supposed to be wise and you don't want to harm people by sharing things with them that they're not ready for because you're going to write your notes in the native language of your own heart and mind. Other people will not be prepared to experience that. But um, you should never be scared of following God in the most efficient ways you can. Um, so you have to balance that. And if you do something in a less efficient way, it needs to be justified by the greatest benefit to all, not an attempt to minimize pain for yourself. Those are two very different motives. Anyway, so typing things up is a good, is a good thing. And if you're a slow typer, it makes sense to invest some time to learn to type faster. So that's an idea. Now, where do you stick this stuff? That's another opportunity to gain efficiency. So uh, the, where I am right now in this process, uh, which has developed over time and has featured an increased willingness to do more than I would have before, because uh, it, is, it is not fun to jump into a situation where you're, um, you're less grounded in boundaries. So I used to write one book at a time, for example, and I'd refuse to think about anything that wasn't laser focused on that book. And I, I thought that was a good thing because I thought the most important thing was to finish the book at hand. The Lord has led me through lessons that um, have replaced that with more important ways, more efficient ways of doing more. And one of those things has been to be open to writing as many things as he tells me about as many things as he tells me and to not worry about the time it takes to finish something. <clears throat> so weird things have come out of that. Like I wrote a whole book about God's justice. It was like 400 pages or something. And it was done and proofread by one person um, and just sitting on my hard drive for six months or something. And uh, I did not feel like the Lord wanted it published just yet. I thought there were things I had to publish before that, specific things. And then one day he said, open up that file. And I opened it up. And he said, these four chapters say, cut them out and I want you to put them in this book. I was like, but the book's done. Cut them out, put them in this book. Okay. Take these two chapters, put them in your general notes file. Okay. Reread these four chapters and break them down by the sentence and put them where they need to go and so on. The whole book got torn apart. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, those things still aren't published. Cool. I mean, he knows what he's doing. I just do what I'm told, right? And I wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, I'd like to know what he's doing too, but I'm just saying I'd, I'm much, I much prefer whatever he wants me to do. So I have a, um, I've evolved my way of doing things over the years, but the present system, I have a general notes file. Right now it is 506 pages. Uh, it fluctuates. I had it down to like 80 pages a few months ago, maybe two months ago, it was 80 pages. And so as I get any thoughts about anything, this is the catch all. It's gonna be here. Um, I organize that 
uh, under headers. And sometimes I can't boil it down to just one phrase. So I will chain together phrases and separate them with the bar. And um, so, so that's sort of, it just gets thrown into there. And then from time to time, I'll go through this maybe and pull out topics. And then I'll create a temporary file that's a topic and I'll pull it all into there and organize it further. A lot of times there are overlaps or related themes. And so a chapter might emerge out of this. These are all proto things like proto headings, proto chapters, proto books. They're not really the real thing yet. And um, it's just a process of sort of it spins around like a galaxy forming and little sub entities begin to gather mass within that swirl. And that's the way it works. If I have questions, I write them down. Uh, I have a section of unanswered questions. It tends to be empty because usually by the time I'm done formulating the question, the Lord answers it. And so it moves out into the notes file. So from this notes file, um, I'll make new things, but I'll also add to old things. And so I'll move things out from there into books. Um, sometimes I'll have questions about things and I'm looking to see if I've ever uh, learned about them before. And I'll remember something I wrote or I'll see something that's totally unrelated and the Lord starts speaking to me about that. And so basically the name of the game is just get everything typed up. Now in typing, I mentioned you might not be the fastest typer in the world. Back in the day, um, there were there was a job called stenographer and the, the job of a stenographer was to make a transcript of a board meeting or whatever was happening. And so they were, they were transcribers, transcriptionists. Um, and a lot of these folks, they, they learned something called shorthand, which was symbolic language to abbreviate commonly used words or phrases so that they could write with their hands much faster than anyone could type. And then they'd go back to their office and translate their notes into words, that they, the, the transcription. So um, you can also learn tricks like this. So one thing that I've become fluent at is using placeholders to keep up with the pace of thought without getting bogged down by things that aren't super clear to me just yet. So if I struggle to find a word for something, um, I'll just write to do, T-O-D-O, -O, which is something that we do very commonly as programmers um, when we know that something's missing. We'll just mark that. And you can, you can create your own little language for placeholders. Um, and then I go back at some later time and fill in the, fill in the gaps or ask questions if I need to, to fill in the gaps. And, and usually those trigger their own chain of revelation. Um, oh, there was something I was going to say about that. Yeah, so it's important to rehash. Uh, maybe it's the first time you're hearing this, but this idea of the language of the spirit, the spirit, it's not incorrect to say the language of the spirit, but but whatever that is, it works a lot differently than anything we understand as far as human language. Because the spirit, every, every word and phrase, it's, it's a static representation. It's, it's bounded. But the spirit has no bounds. It's amazing. If you, you should Google this. If you've never watched a video of a fractal zooming in, Google that and watch it. And that's what it's like when you focus your mind and your heart, because if you don't have desire, real intent, that's one of the keys of getting revelation. But if you focus your mind and your heart on an idea, on a question, on a topic, what happens is the spirit just starts pouring in more. And it's like zooming into that fractal and it all expands. And the, the details increase by so much that it looks like you're looking at a different picture. It's actually the same picture you've always been looking at, just massively greater resolution. And this is one thing that makes it so difficult 
to try to capture revelation because as you're thinking about it to write it, because you have to convert it into human language. You can't, there's no shorthand for the spirit. You have to convert it into a worldly representation, which is by nature limited. And so as you're converting the infinite into the discrete, which is what it means to reveal, you are, um, it's work. It's the work of creation. Um, the verb is to organize. You're, you're creating order out of chaos. And as you do that, it just keeps going. And so you have to come up with ways of drawing boxes around things to then reduce that into human language. And it's a skill. And it's a skill that takes massive time and effort to develop. So, um, you know, it's very off-putting, circling back to the windows of heaven, it's very off-putting for normal people to hear any of this stuff because this is the last thing they want to spend their time on, right? They just want the goodies in the fastest way possible, right? But this is, this is what's actually going on behind the curtain. So um, I briefly mentioned that um, I've learned to tear down the walls I had on how many things I was thinking about at once. And so like right now I've got, let's see how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I have 15 books open that I'm writing. I've got one text file where I wrote down maybe a quarter page of notes to make this video. I've got one PowerPoint presentation that has three slides that I created first thing when I woke up and then just moved on to other things. It's not done, but I just vomited out some ideas that I'll have to come back to later. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what, and then I will sit in this environment for uh, two to 12 hours a day in total isolation. I get up very early for that. So there, no, there are no distractions and I'm not neglecting the other things that uh, are expected of me. Um, and, uh, and that's the process. Um, okay, so that's a good segue into one of my final points, which is uh, the Lord said in John 14, 26, he said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, oh, sorry, speaking of revelation, the Lord says, you better start earlier than that verse. Okay. Um, because he says something like, that, I have many things to teach you, but you're not ready for them. Okay, it's not in that chapter, but there are other places where he says, I have many things to teach you, but you're not ready for them yet. Okay. It's funny, especially in the book of John, there's a, there are all these situations where there's a chain of like two to five verses across chapters that are all on the same topic. And you have to put them together to get the whole story. Um, and it's pretty cool how that all worked out. But anyway, um, so John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. Now let's have some fun. Let's, let's send the atomic bomb, the precision guided missile, the bunker buster right into your brain and set that sucker off. Whom the Father will send in my name. What does that mean? Well, his name is his character. It's the mountain of the Lord. It's how he is. As you live how he is, as far as you understand him to be, the Holy Ghost will come. I, I had a conversation with someone the other day, and I said, isn't it funny? Uh, so this idea is not mine. Um, how uh, most of modern Christianity modern Christianity spends most of its time arguing about why Jesus didn't mean what he said that's a thought of a friend of mine that I was sharing with another friend of mine and then this part is mine I said um, 
But once you get it, you realize that from end to end, the scriptures are exactly what he meant in the plainest possible way, given the constraints of the time and people. And we're just a bunch of retards. <laughs> because he says over and over again, exactly what he's trying to say. He says, the father will send in my name. It, it literally means that as you do everything you know to do, to live exactly like Jesus, he will send the Holy Ghost to show you how to live even more like Jesus. That's the meeting of heaven and earth as you reach up as high as you can go and he will come down every single time to take you higher. And what's the subject matter? All things. Okay, but here's the reason I'm quoting it is the next bit and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Gospel principle, you do all you can, and God will do all he can. The price of everything is everything. The exchange, you give everything you have to God, and God gives everything he has to you. You do everything you can to record everything he tells you, he will do everything he can to bring to remembrance and expand upon everything he said to you that you missed or that you misunderstood or that you only had a limited understanding of. That's the way it works. So the Holy Ghost is our insurance policy. And it's, it's like a, a cracked, a chipped windshield insurance rider uh, in Montana because you always get a cracked windshield in Montana. They put uh, rocks on the road in the winter. And so these kick up and hit your windshield in the spring. And so it's insurance, but it's insurance you're gonna keep using again and again. So it's not really insurance, it's just uh, maintenance. And that's how this is with the Holy Ghost. Because you are absolutely gonna forget things, even when you're doing your best. But as you do your best to record and remember them, and go back to them. He's going to uh, enliven your memory and bring things back into your remembrance. And um, he's like, he's like a rare and faithful friend who borrows your stuff. And whenever he brings it back, it's in better condition than it was. And he says, oh, thanks for lending me your trailer. I actually replaced the two rotted boards that were in the flooring and I tightened all the bolts and lubed up the spinny thing. So, um, inflated the tires. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> one thing I find is that those recollections tend to happen at specific times in the day, specifically when I first wake up. So my warm up period in the morning when I first get down to business is, which is when, as soon as I get up, I have a routine. I wake up, um, you know, I drink something, I go to the bathroom, I'm on my computer. Oh, I drink two eggs, so I eat. But it's all like squeeze this down to the minimal possible time because I know that that's my best part of the day that I can do the most important things. Put first things first. Seek, seek his kingdom first and all things will be added. And so I get to the computer as soon as I can. And... Um, Sorry, I just heard kids talking. I thought it was still like 3 a.m. It's quarter to seven now. So um, in that window, my warm-up time is the spirits just flooding me with things from the day before that I totally missed. And I'll remember promptings that even with all these notepads and the fact that I write down everything he tells me, 
I still don't write down everything he tells me somehow. And there will be some like, sometimes it's nuanced. Like there was this soft little thing that now looking back, I realized it wasn't a soft little thing. It was a really big deal. And now I'll spend an hour looking up this flood of scriptures that are around this cloud of things. Sometimes it was a really big thing and there's just more to add to it or whatever. And so I have to squeeze that orange until the juice is gone every morning. And sometimes it's 20 minutes and sometimes it's five hours. And I don't get to actually writing until that's done. Because whatever God's telling me is more important than anything else I could do. So I hope that's, I hope these, something in this was valuable to you. Um, this is just my present position on all these things, my current experience. Um, so these are very, very important topics. Um, I, I, uh, I'm in the process of writing a book about Revelation, actually. Uh, one of the challenges, <laughs> ironically, about that is it's so interwoven with a body of topics I've put under the heading of God's knowledge and a body of topics I've put under the heading of God's wisdom that I have no idea how to disentangle these things yet. And it's way too many pages to put into one book. So, and I'm trying very hard in these books to come not to repeat myself. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but it makes, um, it makes additions very difficult to track because now you might have the same idea in three places and you need to augment it in all three. And it's also what might be an unnecessary burden if it can be avoided uh, for, for you all because I know that you, you don't have 12 hours a day to read these things. Um, so anyway, there was, there's probably a less gracious way of saying that, but we'll move on. Um, wow, an hour. Hopefully that answers your question, bud. Um, and I hope it's useful for other people. So keep, keep rocking and rolling.